What's up, it's Bladen, and welcome to my Neon White Speedrunning Guide. This video will cover a lot of the tricks and techniques that go into speedrunning this game, however it will not cover any of the specific routes. If you want to learn them, I'll leave a link in the description to both the individual level world record spreadsheet and a White's Heaven Rush guide that I've made. This guide will be tailored toward playing on PC with keyboard and mouse since that's what I and most others use. If you're using a different setup, this video should still be an effective resource since most of the information is easily transferable. And one last thing, if you find the video a little fast paced or confusing at times, that's okay. You can always rewind, you don't need to absorb everything in one go. But anyway, let's get into it. Before practicing any actual movement, we need to first sort out controls and settings. The default binds already work very well for this game. The only recommendation I would make is changing swap card off of Q, since you already use your ring finger to move left. Personally, I've changed it to shift so I can use my pinky, but you can do whatever feels best for you. For your sensitivity, I recommend something on the lower end since there's a lot of aiming in this game. However, there are a handful of large flicks and turnarounds, so you might want to take that into consideration. Moving on to settings, let's take a look at field of view. I recommend setting your FOV as low as possible, to the point where it's still comfortable though. The sun in this game can be quite blinding, but lowering your FOV will mostly get rid of that effect. It'll also help you snipe demons that are very far away. Alternatively, you can use the Puppy Power Tools mod to get rid of the sun, which is legal for speedruns. At the end of the day though, this is all just preference. If it works for you, it works. These are merely suggestions. What isn't up to preference though is frame rate and V-Sync. Changing these settings will actually affect how the game behaves. V-Sync only has a couple specific use cases on some level strategies, so I won't cover them here, but I'll mention frame rate when relevant since it affects a few pieces of tech. Now let's actually get into movement. Going forward, you'll notice that there's an input display in the bottom right corner of gameplay clips. If you're ever unsure of how to execute a certain piece of tech, refer to the input display to try to clear things up. Your base movement kit without any card abilities is actually pretty bare bones. You can jump and run around at a fixed speed. That's it. This makes the movement very simple, but there are still some minor things to touch on in terms of how you interact with the level environment. Running on waterways will give you a lot more speed, so it's best to use them to your advantage if they're not too far out of the way. You can actually get the waterway boost even if you're slightly above it. In this case, you get the speed boost but no friction from the ground, which is slightly faster. This means it's better to approach water from above, or even better, time it with the peak of your jump so you can hover above the water for a brief moment. This can often be achieved by using various discard abilities. You can also achieve this same effect by running near the edge of the waterway since the speed boost still stays active shortly after leaving the waterway. This is called, um, uh... Depending on the geometry near the edge, you'll either have to run parallel along the edge or run slightly off the edge and then back on. Furthermore, on the topic of ground friction, it's generally optimal to jump at the end of waterways to avoid being slowed down by the ground. This philosophy can also be applied to pretty much any grounded speed boost. You can also hold your jump button to automatically jump immediately after landing. Running upstairs is actually slower than normal running, so it's faster to jump past any stairs. And to clarify, this is only for stairs, not slopes. However, if a steep slope is covered in water, it is actually faster to jump up it repeatedly. Typically when coming across breakable surfaces, you'll use a discard ability to break past it. However, they can also be broken by just plain shooting it, but they do have a lot of health. This is a niche strat you can implement on some levels where you can see them well in advance. Like many other platformers, we have access to a coyote jump. This is a grace period that allows you to still jump after leaving a ledge. Unfortunately, coyote jumps are tied to frame rate. If you have a lower frame rate, around 60 FPS or so, it will feel pretty intuitive. However, if you have a higher frame rate such as 120 or 144, it will typically require two inputs for a coyote jump, and you only have a 0.3 second time window to input this. Luckily this becomes a lot easier if you use scroll wheel as a secondary jump bind. For some reason, if you try to jump off the ground with the scroll wheel, it won't work. It only works when you're not on the ground, and it can quickly send multiple inputs, making it perfect for coyote jumps. While movement is the most integral part to speedrunning this game, gunplay is its most important counterpart. The first thing to note is that the spray pattern for automatic guns is actually 100% consistent. This allows you to aim most bullets, if not every bullet, at the same spot by just constantly resetting your spray. Essentially, you just spam click your fire button. 
The first two bullets will always go to the lower left corner of your crosshair, so you'll have to aim up and to the right to account for it. However, the spray will still bloom, so you'll have to progressively aim your crosshair farther and farther away to compensate. You might have discovered on your casual playthrough that you can parry bullets and reflect them back at demons. What you might not have known is that it actually gives a small, brief speed boost. This can also be done by shooting their bullets instead. This is called bullet boosting. It may seem like a negligible benefit, but it can make the difference between a good time and a great time in any run since they are so common. The speed boost you get will actually change depending on whether you're on the ground or in the air. You get a bigger boost when on the ground because the game tries to compensate for friction being incurred, meaning aerial bullet boosts are technically faster due to momentum preservation. But you can abuse this by taking a grounded bullet boost and then making yourself airborne immediately after, either by jumping or falling off a ledge. You can also bullet boost off of your own projectiles, such as purify bombs and rockets. Though rockets are a bit buggy and will sometimes explode prematurely. When any bullet is destroyed, either by being shot or colliding with a wall, it enters a hit decay state, becoming invisible for 0.25 seconds. In some cases, it will stay in that state even longer. A prime example of this is when mimic bullets collide with the wall. During this time, the bullet can still be parried. This is called a phantom parry. Essentially, this allows you to get a second bullet boost out of a projectile by shooting them parrying the same spot. For a simple way of inputting this, you can just hold your fire button after shooting, then switch to katana to slash as soon as possible automatically. This doesn't work with the Godspeed card though. This also works with your own bullets, but it's extremely hard to execute while moving so it sees limited use. Now onto explosion mechanics. There are three different items in the game that can cause an explosion. Purified bombs, barrels, and dominion rockets. When boosting off of explosives, it's possible to be boosted away or toward the explosion, making it feel pretty unintuitive. And that's because it is! The first thing to understand about explosion boosting is that your vertical and horizontal velocities are handled differently. As long as you are anywhere within the explosion's radius, you'll always receive the same vertical velocity. This is why it's possible to be sucked upward toward an explosion. Horizontal velocity is a little bit more complex though. You'll always be boosted in the opposite direction of the explosion, horizontally speaking. How strong this boost is depends on how much the explosion is vertically aligned with your camera. The closer it is to eye level, the stronger the boost. The actual distance from the explosion is irrelevant as long as you're within the radius. Generally speaking, if you want to boost upward, position the explosion directly above or below you. If you want to boost forward, position it behind you at eye level. Explosions will also stack on top of each other additively. Due to how this functions, you'll always get more value out of it the closer they are to exploding at the same time. One last thing about explosion boost, there's an extremely small area at the edge of the radius that I've stood in will give you a much smaller boost for some reason. There's no practical use for this since it's so rare and gives you less speed, it's just something you'll want to avoid. Now let's get into the main gameplay feature, soul cards. Cards can be obtained from raw pickups, enemies, and also vending machines. When picking up a card, you can hold the swap card button to prevent the card from being equipped. However, this only works if you have no cards in your inventory, which limits its use quite a bit. Normally your pickup radius for cards is fairly small, but it can be extended through various actions such as being hit by an explosion, stomping the ground, exiting a zip line, and dashing through breakable objects. On any level, you'll always start with the katana. It's the default card. If you deplete the 30 ammo it comes with, it gets replaced by your fist. If you deplete your fist, you die instantly. This actually pauses the in-game timer, which makes it occasionally useful. It's most effective on the neon green boss fight since green undergoes a death animation at the end of the level. The first card pickup in the game is Purify. It mimics an LMG and has sticky bombs as its discard ability. The bomb is launched in front of you and will explode shortly after sticking to any surface. If airborne long enough, the bomb will actually explode before sticking to anything. The explosion will kill and break anything in its radius, ignoring any physical geometry. This effect applies to all area of effect attacks in the game. The sticky bomb can actually be bullet boosted off of two either by parrying it as soon as it's launched, or by shooting it. In fact, parrying it will tremendously increase the speed that it's launched at. This can be used to make long-range snipe without having to arc your aim at all. 
This also triples the bomb's damage from 8 to 24. This isn't significant for common enemies, but it can be really useful for neon green boss fights. Next up is Elevate. This is essentially a pistol, and its discard ability is an extra jump, which can be consumed at any time. The interesting part about this card is that the extra jump can be added on top of other upward forces, but not all. The exceptions are other elevate cards, balloon jumps, and regular jumps. Every other type of upward force works. This includes explosions, telefragging, exiting the zipline, and shock abuse. For the next card, we have Godspeed. This is a single shot rifle that has 100% accuracy. The discard ability is a horizontal dash that kills or breaks anything in your path. After dashing, the player still experiences some residual momentum from the dash. This means it's better to use the dash in the air or jump off the ground immediately after. These dashes do not stack in any way, so it's optimal to delay any additional dashes until after the momentum has run out, if you have multiple Godspeed cards. Dashing will also cancel out any vertical velocity that you have, making it useful for both delaying your fall and mid or waterway boosts. The player has a fairly low terminal velocity in this game. Luckily we have the stomp card to speed things up. This is an SMG with a lot of recoil. The discard ability shoots the player downwards, slamming into the ground. This produces an area of effect hitbox that kills or breaks anything within its radius. If you stomp on top of a breakable entity, such as an enemy or a breakable floor, you'll actually retain terminal velocity and won't have to accelerate downward again. Using an elevate card while stomping will result in an unusual interaction. It will allow you to move horizontally during the stomp, but the elevate's velocity will not overwrite the stomp's velocity. Instead, it's just added on top of it, meaning you'll slow down as the elevate's velocity is applied, but will start to speed up after. Next up is the fireball card. This is a shotgun that shoots out a cone of bullets where each bullet is shot at the same angle each time. Unfortunately, there's no center bullet, so lining up long range shots can be difficult. Luckily, we can use the crosshair to determine where some of the bullets will go, even if they're not center. Personally, I use these two vertices immediately outside of the inner circle to aim the innermost bullets on the left and right side of the spray. However, this is dependent on your FOV. This lineup only worked with 80 FOV, which I use. Here are some other spots you can look to on 90 and 110. Similarly to Godspeed, the discard ability is a dash, except you can aim it in any direction. Additionally, the hitbox surrounding you actually remains active for about a full second after discarding the card, not just during the dash. On top of that, you're also given a speed boost when grounded during this time. So in contrast to Godspeed, it's better to aim this dash at the ground so you can also get that speed boost. There are also a few quirks with this discard ability, the first being that you can coyote jump out of the dash. The second is that dashing into shocker enemies can cause it to launch you multiple times. However, this needs to be done in a specific way or it will not work. First of all, you need to have a certain frame rate for this to be consistent. Theoretically, it's most consistent at 60 FPS or lower, but I found it to still be very consistent at 75 and even low to mid 80s. After that, the consistency starts to drop off hard. It's possible to get launched up to five times, but for most applications, you only need to be launched two or three times, which is pretty consistent. The second part to executing this trick is aiming the dash. You want to aim it almost at the center of the shocker, but not quite. You're aiming for the empty space between the black creature and the pedal. These shocker launches can be quite finicky, but luckily they aren't too common throughout the game. For our next card, we have Dominion. This would be the strongest card in the game if it weren't for a certain gimmick card coming up shortly. This is a rocket launcher with a zipline as the discard ability. The rockets will travel in a straight line exploding upon impact. This explosion will kill or break anything in its radius as well as boost the player if they're within that same radius. The zipline will let you attach to any surface and move straight toward it. You can cancel the zipline early by jumping. Ending the zipline will actually give you a very brief speed boost since the zipline speed combines with your normal movement. Normally, ending the zipline will give you a small upward velocity, but if you zipline at a steep decline, you'll just fall instead. And for the last and most overpowered card, we have the Book of Life. It's also commonly referred to as Boof due to the fonts on the card. This card allows the player to telefrag to objects and enemies, as in teleporting and killing it. 
It has infinite ammo and extremely long range, but not infinite as you can see here. The exception to this is the book at the end of chapter 11 levels. It's only accessible within a much smaller range. The card only requires that you barely have line of sight of a hurt box in order to teleport. Due to misaligned geometry on some levels, it's possible to teleport through walls sometimes, skipping large sections of levels. Some of these seam shots are easier than others due to a feature with a card that makes the crosshair remain targeted for a brief moment after losing your aim on something. However, red walls will overwrite this effect and cause the crosshair to go into an untargeted state again. In some parts of the game, it's optimal to fire a weapon as fast as possible. The fire rate can be changed by switching between tapping the fire button and holding it, but which is faster isn't the same for every weapon. All you need to know is that for the katana and fireball card, it's faster to hold. For every other card, it's faster to tap. And of course this doesn't apply to purify and stomp since they're automatic guns. The last main feature to talk about in this video is demons. There's not many things to cover aside from shoot demon equals win, but they are significant. The first thing is that demons can be stood on top of, even jumped off of. This can be used to get a little extra height and make jumps that are otherwise not possible. Demons can actually engage in friendly fire to some degree. Most players are made aware of this once being introduced to tripwires. Their lasers will damage anything that it touches when the tripwire is killed. This can even be used to set off chain reaction kills with multiple tripwires, saving you the effort of having to kill everything. Guardians and Mimics are also guilty of this. Their attacks can be used to kill other demons, though we've yet to see an effective use of Guardians anywhere, likely due to the charge up time. Demons can also be killed by taking away their platform. You may have noticed while playing the game that jumper enemies actually jump before and after attacking. This actually moves their hurtbox upward with their model, making it easy to miss sometimes if you shoot at the wrong time. This is more so a problem when attempting chain reaction kills, since it's harder to gauge the timing. Before we move on to the next topic, shockers get to rear their ugly head again as we're now going to talk about kill duping. You'll notice that shocker enemies are comprised of two separate entities, the petals and the black creature in the middle. When shooting the creature or landing on a petal, it kills that part of the shocker and the other, but doesn't decrement the demon's remaining count for the latter. However, if we kill both at the same time by hitting the creature while landing on a petal, it decrements twice, effectively removing the need to kill one more demon in the level. This is a frame perfect trick, but we can vary our frame rate in this game. So obviously the lower the frame rate, the easier it becomes, but at a certain point the game becomes pretty much unplayable. I've gone as low as 30 FPS, but I've heard from several members of the community that 60 FPS isn't bad either. Since the in-game frame rate setting only uses values from your monitor's refresh rate, you may need to use third-party software for a specific value. But that's gonna wrap up the guide. Thank you to everyone who managed to watch this far. I really do appreciate it. I put a lot of effort into trying to level up my production quality for this one, so I hope it didn't go unnoticed. Also, thank you to everyone in the Discord that provided feedback and suggestions during the production of this video. I also want to give a shout out to Shovel Claws and Pandora for making the tech document since it was a big help to me in structuring this video. Honestly, double shout out to Pandora because there are so many confusing little mechanics in this game that we would not understand at all if it weren't for them looking through the code of this game and relaying just massive amounts of information. I tried to omit most of the details to keep the guide digestible for newcomers, but it's all in the community discord and the code dissection channel if you're interested in reading up on it. Speaking of the community discord, it is booming. Most of the time I look in there, there's always people grinding down their level times. There's some seriously dedicated runners testing the limits of the game and their own capabilities every day. Which reminds me, don't hesitate to take breaks if you feel discomfort or pain in your hands and wrists. It's not worth it. Some levels are an especially big culprit of causing this. But yeah, that's it. Come run the end with us. Peace. Also subscribe and follow me on Twitch.